Hi, and thanks for checking out my video. I'm going to break down the process for how I made this bench from these chairs. The first part of the equation is to join the chairs into a single frame. To start, I remove the old seats and temporarily attach a 2x4 to the chairs. The 2x4 acts to keep the chairs straight relative to each other and to maintain their spacing while I work on the project. When ready, I move the project to the workbench and cut off the two inside front legs. This is an aesthetic choice to make the final piece of furniture feel more like a conventional bench. I leave the inside rear legs because I don't mind their appearance and they'll add support to the bench. Now I begin the process of carving grooves or mortises for the connective pieces of the bench. These joints have to be tight and strong to provide the support required for the frame to stay together. I'm essentially using a mortise tenon joint to get the strength I need. Now that the chairs are prepped for joining, I need to carefully measure the spacing between the chairs so I can cut wood to the correct length. These particular chairs are narrower at the back of their seats than they are at the front. It's a subtle design feature I didn't notice when selecting the chairs, but it has an important effect on my project. It will cause my bench to have a bowed front. It also means I have to cut the connective pieces of wood with precise angles to create clean joints. For consistency in the design of the bench, I want the added pieces of wood to match their original counterparts. Stretchers are the narrow strips of wood that reinforce the chair partway down the legs, and I start with those. On these chairs, they're shaped simply with rounded edges, so I'm doing the work by hand. The apron of the chair, which is where the seat attaches, has a slightly more complex design. I use a router to achieve a large round on the bottom edge and then flip the piece to apply a DuPont profile. A DuPont profile is essentially a rounded edge with a decorative step. Once the connective pieces are shaped and cleaned up, I apply a liberal amount of glue and tap into place. This method of joining is creating three to five contact surfaces between each mating part and will be as strong or stronger than most mechanical fastening methods. While the assembled frame is drying, I move on to cutting the wood for the seat. Having measured the seat space, I did some earlier work in Photoshop to optimize my layout and calculate the size of the squares I need to cut. I now set up my saw and get to work. To complete my design, I need to cut over 250 pieces of wood half of which are these maple and walnut squares. They quickly begin to stack up. When all the squares have been cut, I move on to the American cherry. Cherry is a warm, medium tone wood that will provide a decorative transition between the dark walnut and the light maple, and will keep the seat from looking like a chessboard. But to get the size and angles just right, I have to make over 500 cuts. Now that all my pieces are cut, it's time to do a quick test run. Dry fading the pieces is an important step because it will reveal any major errors in my work before glue up. Once glue has been applied, the options to turn back and make a correction become extremely limited. Everything checks out, so I'm ready to begin the assembly. Due to the large quantity of pieces and the complex nature of this assembly, I have to do it in stages. I start off by gluing all the mitered cherry pieces around the maple squares. Each unit consists of two stacked maple squares and four cherry sides. The reason for stacking the squares is twofold. It costs less money to buy thinner wood, but I'm also creating a more stable piece. When wood expands or contracts across changing seasons, 
Most of the movement occurs in the direction of the grain. By gluing the squares together with their grain rotated 90 degrees relative to each other, the wood movement should be balanced and limited in its effect. With all the maple and cherry units complete, it's time to join everything together by adding the walnut. I have a limited supply and variety of clamps, so I again do the work in stages. As each subassembly is clamped, I allow it to dry for a period of hours before beginning the next subassembly. Over a period of days, it begins to take shape. Finally, the glue up phase is done, but now it's time to clean my work. The surface is nowhere near flat, which means it won't be very comfortable to sit on. The seat is 18 inches deep, and my planer can only accommodate 12 inches, so I need to take a slower approach. Across the period of an hour and a half, I aggressively sand the seat until it's flat and smooth. I start with a 60 grit belt sanding and progress systematically to 220 grit on my orbital sander. The seat is now ready to be shaped to fit the frame, but the frame has some complex angles and features, so I draft the shape onto inexpensive plywood before cutting the blank. After the drafting is complete, I cut the plywood into a template and test fit it into the bench. I fine tune the shape until it's a perfect fit on the frame. Now the template is ready for use. I trace the design onto the seat blank. I have to borrow from the scrap of the blank to supplement a couple of locations where the bench was longer than I calculated during the design phase. After the revisions are dried, I cut the blank into its final shape. This work would be better done using a bandsaw, but I'll have to settle for my table saw. I do my best to manage the piece, but tweak it during cutting and leave a number of burn marks I'll need to sand out later. Before sanding though, I get out my router again to round the edges of the seat. Rounding the edges provides a simple aesthetic detail, makes the seat more comfortable, and also is more durable than a hard edge, which can be more easily damaged. I now circle back to clean up not only the sides, but also to perfect the top surface. It's important that these areas be free from defect for the finishing steps ahead. I also take time to vacuum up any stray dust caught in the wood from the sanding process. When I'm satisfied, I give the piece its first coat of finish and let it dry. I then work pure powdered copper into an emulsion using the same finish already applied to the wood. I play with the consistency of the mixture until it has the feel of wood putty, and when it's right, I liberally apply it and work it into the whole surface of the piece. There are some small gaps caused by imperfect fitting during the assembly process. Rather than trying to disguise these errors, I use the copper putty to fill them in a way that adds a subtle flourish to the piece. The filled space will look better than gaps, but also better than simple putty. When the putty is cured, I give it a final sanding, working up to 400 grit. 
The process removes the excess putty, but also brightens the remaining copper and creates a beautiful metallic sheen, too subtle to be seen here. The seat is finally done. Before assembling the bench though, I need to clean up and paint the frame. I quickly sand the painted parts of the frame to knock loose old paint, and then spray over the whole thing with a metallic paint. After a quick run with the dog, it's time to bring it all together. I drop the seat into place, give it a quick test, and then put the whole thing onto the workbench. Using the same holes where the original seats were attached, I mount the new seat with screws. The bench is now complete and ready to be enjoyed for years to come. Thanks for watching. Please like and share. And don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram for similar projects in the future.